In September 1939, Poland, not for the first time, was wiped off the map. But it was the first time that anyone important actually cared, namely Poland's Western allies, Britain and France. Eight months later, after a period of inactivity on the Western Front in the Phony War, German troops turned west and invaded Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands and France on May 10th, 1940. By that June, all four countries had fallen, Britain's expeditionary force had fled mainland Europe, and France, like Poland, was occupied by Germany. Or at least, half of France was. You see, the French never technically surrendered. Instead, they signed an armistice, an official end of open hostilities, and the government of the French Republic, now based in the town of Vichy, survived in a southern free zone. It did not, however, survive unharmed, which begs the question, how bad was Vichy France? As well as splitting up the country, the armistice also limited the French army to no more than 100,000 men, mandated that the French fleet remain in port, and kept roughly 2 million French soldiers imprisoned in Germany. Under such circumstances, it could be argued that France's new leader, 84-year-old World War I hero, Marshal Philippe Pétain, had no choice but to consent to the demands of Germany. And that is probably true. But Pétain was no guardian angel attempting to do his best to preserve French traditions in the face of German opposition. He was a staunch authoritarian who actively dismissed the Republican notion of natural equality among all men, instead believing in a strictly organized social hierarchy. To Pétain, France's defeat by Germany was proof of French moral decay, which he blamed on the Republic. For example, in the 1920s, he was a vocal critic of French military policy, which in preparation for a repeat of World War I, focused almost exclusively on defense. Pétain favored a much more proactive military policy in order to compete with a modernizing Germany, including long periods of conscription. But that was unpopular among the French people, and so under the Republic, it wasn't put into place. As it turned out, France could have used policies similar to Pétain's. Regardless, on the 10th of July 1940, after the ratification of the armistice and with Germans occupying two-thirds of their country, the French parliament rewrote their constitution and gave Pétain effectively absolute power as chief executive of the new French state. With his newfound powers, he abolished the French presidency and dissolved parliament with no call for future elections. By January 1941, Pétain had achieved complete control over the country, becoming arguably the most powerful French leader since the absolutist Louis XIV. He even went so far as to replace France's republican motto, liberty, equality, fraternity, with the more ominous work, family, and fatherland. Like most dictatorships, the Vichy government abolished freedom of speech and of the press, making it a crime to so much as express an anti-government view. But in spite of all this, Bataan and the Vichy government were relatively popular, especially in the first years of the regime. Many Frenchmen, especially conservatives, had, like Bataan, become disillusioned with the Republic and preferred his stable, right-wing Vichy government to the chaos and the socialists that had dominated the Republic. But the worst crime of the Vichy French was the state's harsh anti-Jewish laws. Barely a month into power, Bataan banned Jews from most forms of employment and revoked French citizenship from thousands of them. Then he allowed for the internment of Jews in camps in France and sent out the French police to hunt Jewish fugitives, only to then send them by train to Germany. Many never returned. Similar policies were applied to French territory in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia, but in late 1942, Allied successes, especially in North Africa, convinced the Germans that Vichy France had served its purpose, and their military occupied the Free Zone. The Vichy government became a mere figurehead of Germany until the liberation of France in 1944. After the war, Philippe Pétain was put on trial and sentenced to death for treason against the French Republic, but because of his service during World War I and his advanced age, the leader of the Free French, Charles de Gaulle, commuted his sentence to life in prison. Pétain died in 1951 at age 95. So how bad was Vichy France? Well, it was a state that valued efficiency and social cohesion above individual rights and the happiness of its people. It was a military regime that destroyed a democracy, albeit a dysfunctioning one, in the form of the Third French Republic, but it did work to keep its citizens physically safe, at least the ones Pétain considered worthy. And it vested near complete power into the hands of one man, a man who was personally anti-Semitic and, while not a fan of Germany, was certainly eager to do her dirty work in France. So pretty bad. On the other hand, the existence of the Vichy government preserved some form of French independence as Germany was steamrolling across the rest of Europe, 
And ultimately, when the Germans occupied the entirety of France, much worse conditions were imposed on her people. But it should always be remembered that while the Germans may have beaten the Third French Republic, it was Frenchmen that killed her. Hey look, you made it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss our next one. And as always, I've been James, and thank you for watching Look Back History.